this morning, I want us to think together about the long-term trajectory of our lives. I want us to think about, like, what would, it, what would it look like if you and I could imagine the person that God wants us to become? Christian, what would it look like if you could see a future version of yourself where God has completed the good work that he began in you? Donald Whitney, in his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, he, he gives this illustration. He says, imagine six-year-old Kevin whose parents have just put him into music school or music lessons. And every day he comes home and after school he picks up his guitar and he just kind of reluctantly begins to practice while his mind is, man, I would just much rather be outside playing baseball with my friends. One day as he comes home and begins to practice, um, an angel shows up in the living room and he, he takes Kevin to, um, in a vision, he takes Kevin to Carnegie Hall and he puts him in, in the middle of this concert where this just expert guitar player is just playing so eloquently. He's playing just masterfully. Kevin is just sitting there and he's soaking the entire experience in. He thinks about how he plays and how awkward his hands feel while he's trying to chord the guitar, while, how toneless it sounds sometimes when he just can't get it right. But he's just drinking it in. He loves the experience. After it's over, the vision kind of vanishes. They go back into uh, the living room and, and Kevin's got his guitar and the angel says, Kevin, I want you to understand something. That, that, that vision, that person who played that guitar so masterfully, so eloquently, so that, that person is you in a few short years. But what you have to do, Kevin, you have to practice. You have to practice. So watch this. If we are a believer in Christ, if you have committed your life to Christ, you've responded to the gospel, you've repented of your sins, made him Lord in your life, then you can have a similar experience as Kevin had. You can know the future you, Christian. You can know the person that God wants you to become, the person that you will become. Romans 8, 29, it's a beautiful promise. Don't get stuck up on a couple words here. They look like a lot of debate. It says, the, says this, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of the Son. So that's you, believer. If you are a Christian, then you will be made like Christ. That is the future version of yourself. It's a promise. Lock it down. Count it. You will be made like Christ. So I guess the ultimate question then, and the question that we're going to set out to try to discover the answer to this morning, how do we get there? If I will be made like Christ, and I'm most certainly not right now, how do I pursue that? How do I get there? I don't know if you, you think about this or, or thought about this before. Um, you know, we're all kind of the results of the habits we make in our lives, right? Right? You are the result of the choices that you make. Someone once said, first we make our habits, and then our habits make us. The things that we do over and over and over and over again become who we are. We are not what we dream about becoming. We are what we do consistently. So I think one of the ways we get from where we are right now in our walks with Jesus to the person that God wants us to become is through spiritual habit. We must learn to develop and implement spiritual habit in our lives. So we're in the, the fifth month of this thing we're calling 10, right? Fifth month of this church-wide emphasis called 10, where the vision is for all of us as a church body to deepen our walks with Christ and to strengthen our influence in the culture, right? Deepen our walks with Christ and strengthen our influence in the culture, do you know that that's where God wants you to be right now, Christian? He wants you to be deepening in your walk with Christ. He wants you to be strengthened so that you can leverage that influence in the culture for his good and his renown here in Denver. That's where God wants you to be. One of the beautiful things about 10 is that it lays out for you a map of how to develop, how to implement these spiritual habits in your life. Like if you want to deepen your walk with Christ and strengthen your influence in the culture, then you must develop some spiritual habits in your life. Spiritual habits of 10 minutes with the Lord each day. Spiritual habits of praying for 10 people each day. 10 verses committed to memory. 10 presentations of the gospel. 10 intentional missional expressions. 10% of your income and 10% increased involvement. 
If you want to deepen your walk with Christ and strengthen your influence in the culture, then you must take regular action to develop these things in your life. One of the things that Tin has done for me in my walk with the Lord, it, it has kind of renewed a love for memorizing Scripture. There was a point in my time when I loved to memorize Scripture. And there was a, um, been several years that is just kind of, I've not really been very intentional about doing that. But man, I fell in love again with memorizing Scripture. Usually in student ministry, what we'll do is we'll start either Wednesday nights, which is our, um, kind of our, our student ministry worship time, student-led band. I'll um, preach a little bit. I mean, it's a lot of fun. Students, if you don't come to that, you need to be there. It's awesome. You'll, you'll love it. Or if we do it on Sunday mornings during small groups, we'll start our times. Hey, um, what is the Lord showing you through your 10? How's your 10 minutes with the Lord? What is God showing you? Have, have you got the chance to share the gospel with anybody this week? Tell me about that. Usually, it ends up with us talking about scripture memorization. Who knows the verse for, for this month? And usually, it's either Jenna Hellman or Ricky Carlson. Ricky will kind of do one of these things. Like, I kind of know it. So like, Ricky, let me hear it. And he'll, you know, he'll, he'll say it. So here's what I want to do for us this morning. Okay, pop quiz time. You guys, you want to come up and grab a mic? Um, this is Luke and Liberty, two of my middle school students. Um, they are going to be walking around. I'm going to ask you the, to know the memory verses. Who knows May's? I know we're seven days in, just a weekend, but who knows May's memory verse? You're going to raise your hand. You're going to say it. Somebody's going to, with the mic, is going to come over and give you, um, let you say it. And then if you say it correctly, you're going to get a, uh, like a $5 gift card to the coffee bar out here. All right? So a little incentive, a um, little bribery. I've learned that that helps a little bit with students. Um, so hey, who knows May? Who knows May? Luke, right here. Tell me your name and what small group are you a part of? Uh, actually, I'm Jenna Hellman's dad. <laughs> Love it. Love it. And uh, I'm in families of faith. Well, great. Families of faith. Oh, you know, I, I remember the, uh, Steve Great. Hill. Great. All right, what's May's memory verse? Rejoice always. Um, pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in, in Christ Jesus. Nailed it. Great job. Thank Great you. job. Hey, let's give him some. <laughs> Luke, did you give him the card? Great job. Great job. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. All right, it's going to get a little tougher. Who knows? April. April. We're going to go back a little bit. You got to look? April. Name small group. Name and small group. Yes, we're in uh, Northern Lights. Nice. My name is David Elliott. Awesome. Uh, April. That was Galatians 5. Cor 2023. Yes, sir. But the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Great job. Different translation. He kicks it old school. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Right? Great job. All right, we're going backwards. Let's try to do our months backwards. We're at March, right? March. My favorite memory verse so far, it is just straight gospel. Memorize it. It's just the best one out there, right? You can say that about all of them, but here you go. March. Who knows March? March. Galatians 2.20. Ricky. Ricky knows it. Come on. Somebody. Run, Luke. Go for it. It's all right. I'll get him one. All right, March, Galatians 2, 20. Let's hear it, Ricky. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Killed Galatians it. Good 20. job, dude. Good job. Good job. Come on, representing student ministry. I hear you, Ricky. All right, February. February. Caitlin knows it. The Carlsons. Um, my name is Kayla Carlson. I'm from the youth um, ministry and all that. So, um, for, I, for I know the plans I have for you to praise the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. Two out of five for student ministry. All right. First memory verse, the foundational verse of 10. Maggie. 
Come on. Luke, your sister's going to show you up. <laughs> Great job, dude. All right, Maggie, Psalm 119.11. Let's go. Come on. Great job. Great job. Great job. Um, I'm glad you guys actually knew the verses. It's going to be really awkward if you didn't know them. So great job. Great job. Um, hey, um, I hope most of you guys have been committed to 10 throughout these five months. I hope many of you have memorized those five verses. Um, and if you're in here this morning, you're like, man, I've been here for a long time, and I know we're supposed to be doing this 10 thing, but not really been in it. Um, or maybe you came in a little bit after we began this whole thing. Or maybe you started 10 and you're like, man, I killed it January, man. I, February is on it strong, but March it kicked my tail. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. So wherever you're at on that spectrum, I just want you to encourage you, man, start it today. Start it now. You can finish these five months out strong. 10 is not about perfection, church. It's not about perfection, but it is about progress. It is about progress. Join with us as we strive to deepen our walks with Christ and strengthen our influence in the culture. For the rest of our time today, um, we're going to be looking at 10, but we're going to do it from kind of a different angle than we have talked about it previously. Uh, we're going to be in the book of 1 Timothy. We're going to look about three verses this morning. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let me remind you before we get into this. Christian, you have an amazing promise that if you are a true believer, you will be conformed into the image of the Son. You will be Christ-like. But we're asking the question, how does that happen? How does that happen? 1 Timothy 4, we're going to be in verses 7 through 10. Remember, Paul is Timothy's spiritual mentor. Paul has taken Timothy under his wing to mold him and to shape him into the man that God wants Timothy to become. Timothy at this time, he's a young pastor in the city of Ephesus, and Paul's writing this letter to encourage him to say, hey, Timothy, keep pursuing after Christ. I know you're young. You're in a tough place of doing ministry, but you can do it. Your job is to be an example of what it's to be like Christ. So let's read. Verse 7. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of, va of value in every way, as it holds promise to the present life and also the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those that believe. So if we can kind of give a summary statement of what Paul is telling Timothy here, if we can kind of wrap all this up, I think what Paul's telling Timothy, he goes, Timothy, godliness is the direction of the Christian life. Godliness is the direction of the Christian life. At the end of the day, if you simplify this thing all the way down, throw out all the other questions, if you just simplify the Christianity and the purpose of your life, the purpose is for you to pursue Christ, for you to become godly, for you to pursue Christ's likeness in your life. When I was studying for this, um, for this talk, I was listening to this guy, and he was talking about setting goals for yourself. And um, at one point in his life, he was um, working at like a Planet Fitness at a gym, and his job was to sell three-year three gym memberships. And he said as he was selling these things, he, he noticed something very, very, very strange, something very peculiar. He said that, that very, very few people continued to work out just one to two months after they purchased this three-year gym membership. He noticed that, that these people, they were all excited during the, the first month of their, uh, of their journey. Maybe they, some of them continued into the second month, but very, very few people, if they did not have a specific, strategic, intentional plan to achieve their goal, they would just fade out. They'd fizzle out. So as some time passed, he would begin to kind of interview these people a little bit more. Hey, what do you want to get out of this three-year gym membership? Luke, what do you want your life to become as a result of this? And then, I want to lose 10 pounds. I want to get more fit. Whatever the case may be. He would sit down and he would begin to develop a strategic plan for them to accomplish their goals. He said that those that had a strategic plan... Those that had an intentional way of achieving their goal were 10 times more likely to achieve that goal than those without one. Pretty important, right? 
I was thinking about that. Man, isn't that the same thing? Isn't that kind of true of the Christian life as well? Like, like, if you don't know where you're going as a follower of Christ, then how in the world do I know which direction to go in? If I don't know the end game, then how am I ever going to know when I arrive? Verse 8. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. So godliness is the direction of the Christian life. That's our aim, that's our goal, that's what we're striving towards. Paul reminds Timothy, goes, hey, godliness, it has reward. It has reward in this life and in the life to come. Growing up, I played um, baseball all my life, like from six years old all the way up to I was 18 years old. I mean, every single weekend we were playing ball. Um, a little claim to fame, um, I played against Madison Bumgarner, the left-hander that played, uh, plays for the Giants, right? I mean, just absolute beast. Um, he's kind of made a, a poor decision to ride dirt bikes and kind of messed up his shoulder. But um, I know one thing about rednecks, and I can say that we grew up in a very, very close proximity. Um, he is one because he bought his wife a, a calf for their engagement present, right? So he's a redneck, right? You give a redneck money and free time, bad things are going to happen, right? Bad things will happen. Um, just count it down. It usually starts with either hold my beer or hey, watch this, right? Like, like, and then you just know, call the paramedics, get them here. Um, it's going to be bad, right? So here, listen to this. Um, so... <laughs> Um, growing up, I played baseball, right? Primarily played um, first base, uh, probably the one I was best at, most gifted at. Probably had the best shot of playing college baseball, playing first base. But uh, I love playing third. That was, that was my, my position. It kept me engaged in the game. I loved it. I got to show off my arm every now and then when I got a, a ball hit to me. I mean, I'd, look, I'd make Nolan Arenado look like a little leaguer with this thing, right? I mean, like, it was, it was great. Um, but I also pitched. Um, wasn't so good at that one. I won't tell you why, but um, um, it's hard to, to throw it in a little box, right? Right-hander got a little tail on your ball. It ends up hitting people, and they get mad, right? Um, so it, it happens sometimes. So, so growing up, I, I played baseball, right? And every single day of my life, man, I can remember just training for baseball, training, training, training. Sometimes we'd play close to home in North Carolina. Most of the time we would go and we'd play in the surrounding states, usually in Columbia, South Carolina, or Charleston. Love to play the ball in Charleston. But in high school, we got to play these things called showcase tournaments. In a showcase tournament, what it was is you would go and these teams would just be stacked with all kinds of college and professional um, players that's looking for, for a scholarship, right? So when you got to play ball, man, it was against the best. It was against great competition. But the purpose was to play in front of the college and professional scouts for the purpose of getting, a re, or, or getting rewarded a scholarship of some kind, right? So when we got the chance to play, man, it, it was great. But what I failed to understand when I, when I was playing ball is that playing well in front of all these scouts, playing well in front of these, um, or, or against all these other great competitors, man, it wasn't, it was really a result of all the work I put in during the week, right? I didn't even, uh, it was a result of the work I put in. I remember waking up so, so early in the mornings, going to school, lifting weights, hitting the arm bands, trying to strengthen the ligaments and the muscles in my arm, trying to, I would hold a baseball a certain way and I would flip it. If you, if you play baseball, you know this. You'd hold it, a curveball like this, and you'd snap your, snap your fingers together. You're just trying to get a little bit better feel on your curveball, a little bit sharper break on your curveball, so you're just a little bit better than the next guy. After school, after baseball practice, you'd come home. I built an indoor batting cage in my, um, in, in my basement. I took some old carpet um, and hung it up by some baling twine. And I'd take a, a tee and I'd do um, drills, just hitting the ball one-handed, just trying to get muscle memory, slow it, go, go top hand, and just trying to get a little bit better. I had a plan to train my physical body for the reward of earning a baseball scholarship. See, each one of you do the exact same thing in your life, whether you think about it or not. We live in Denver, right? We'll just take, I mean, one of the healthiest cities in America, the state, one of the healthiest states in America. I mean, there's a CrossFit on every single corner here, right? I mean, you got 
mountains to hike. You got trails to walk. You ride your bike. I mean, you go out for a walk. I mean, it's sunny 300 days a year. I mean, you're outside always doing fun stuff, right? You're training your body. Why? To be healthy, to live a little bit longer, to get the beach bod on for when you go um, to, to the beach in a few months. I mean, whatever it is, right? You have a plan. You work out your physical body for this reward that you have set up in your mind. But what Paul is saying here, he goes, when you work out the physical body, it's great and you should do that. But when it compares to eternity, all of the work that you put in, it ends at your physical life, right? It ends at death. But when it comes to godliness, it is the only investment by which anything you put into it in this life pays off in the next. It says, unlike physical training that ends at the end of your life, spiritual training has reward not only in this life, but in the life to come. Pursuing godliness, church, pursuing godliness, Christian, it has great reward in this life. But it also has reward in the next. But if you're like me, you want to know, man, godliness is the direction of the Christian life. That's my aim. Sounds good. Godliness has reward in this life and the next. I'm all about it. But how do I become godly? How do I pursue that? I think there's three primary ways that God grows us into godliness. The first two work kind of from the outside in, and we really don't have much control over it. The last one, however, works from the inside out. And I think God has given us great responsibility. The first one is this. God uses people to grow us into godliness. God uses people to grow us into godliness. Proverbs 27, 17, you guys will know this. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So God is going to use people in your life to make you more Christ-like. He's going to use your friends. He's going to use your family. He's going to use your school teachers. He's going to use your small group leaders. He's going to use the people that are close to you. He's going to use people that are far from you. He's going to use your very best friends. He may even use your enemies. But nonetheless, God will use the people that's entered into your life to grow you into godliness. Second way that God grows you into godliness is God uses circumstances. God uses circumstances to grow you into godliness. All of us are the products of our experience and circumstances, right? Another great promise, Romans 8, 28. For those who love God, all things work together for good. For those that are called according to his purpose. So he'll use the events of your life. He'll use the times when you lose your best friend. He'll use the times when your family life is awful. He'll use the times when the most important thing that you've invested so much time and effort in is just ripped away from you. He'll use the time when you take your two or three week old son to the doctor because he's got a cough and 24 hours later they said the best chance of his survival is to put him on a, a ventilator to intubate him. He'll use those times to grow you into godliness. He'll use the times when, when, when your kids are rebelling against you. He'll use the times when all of your life seems like it's a loss. But understand this great and beautiful promise. Everything that enters into your life, Christian, everything that happens to you first passes by the good hands of your good father. Nothing happens by happenstance. It's not left up to chance. Don't think it's coincidence. There's a purpose in behind it, and that purpose is to grow you into godliness. but it's hard because we don't have any control about what happens to us sometimes. But the last one, however, I think we've been given great responsibility for. The third way that God grows us into godliness is God uses spiritual habit. God uses spiritual habit. And I want to make one clarification here as we move forward. I don't believe that you can grow yourself into godliness. You yourself, by your own, I don't think you can conjure up enough strength, enough effort to do it by yourself. But what I think you can do is place yourself in an environment where spiritual growth can occur. That's by spiritual habit. I mean, I, I really wish I would have seen this one when I was Luke's age when I was in middle school, when I was in high school. I, I wish I would have understood that God has given me great responsibility for me to place myself in an environment where I can grow into Christ's likeness. 
I mean, I hope you guys understand that you are responsible for your walk with Christ. Students, it's not your parents' job to force you to go to small groups, to force you to go to the peak on Wednesday nights to grow you into godliness. Young adults, it's not your small group leader to force you to grow into godliness. Church, it's not even your pastor's job to force you to grow into godliness. We can give you all the resources we can. We can come in here and preach the word of God week in and week out, give you great opportunities to respond to the Holy Spirit, but I cannot force you to walk with Jesus. So this is me right now in my walk with Christ. This is every one of us. Maybe your relationship with the Lord is great right now. Maybe it's as close and as vibrant as it has ever been. Maybe you are just killing it spiritually right now. Maybe the opposite is true. Maybe you are, man, maybe spiritual life, man, it's drying up. It feels like it's at a loss right now. I feel like just quitting. It's not worth it. Whatever. Maybe you're in this circle and you've been following the Lord for many, many, many years. Maybe most of your life. Maybe you're like Vince and is a brand new believer in his walk with Christ and just fired up about what the Lord is doing in his life and through him. It doesn't matter what your story is right now. The purpose and the direction that we're heading is over here towards godliness, right? That's what we've said the entire time. How did Paul tell Timothy to get there? Verse 7, train yourself for godliness. Train yourself for for godliness. Some of your translations will say, discipline yourself for godliness. The, the word that Paul uses here, it's, it's really interesting. Um, it, it may make some of you kind of a little awkward, but the, the word, or feel awkward, uh, the, the word that, that he's saying here, it was used to describe someone who runs naked. In his time, there was um, athletes, right? They would train um, their bodies. They would train, go through all kinds of training. But what they'd do, they'd run, they would run naked because they didn't want anything to impair their ability to reach the goal that they were going towards, right? The, the word that Paul uses here is the same word that we get our word gymnasium from. He says, gymnasium yourself for godliness. He's saying, with with the same way that you train yourself physically, with the same amount of passion, with the same amount of intentionality, with the same amount of vigor, you better be training your spiritual body all the more. Train yourself. Gymnasium yourself. It's a singular verb, which means you are responsible. It's up to you. Hey, you go and train yourself for godliness. It's also an imperative, which means it's a command. It's not left up to, it's not an option. It's not left up to how you feel. Man, I don't know, Landis. I mean, uh, I got this two month old kid. I wake up early and I'm dragging. I've already hit the snooze button seven times and I walk down and I'm just, like even though I've got a great and selfless wife that takes care of the baby at night and she wakes up with him and puts him back to bed, changes his diapers, um, it's great blessing and everything. And I'm walking down the steps and I just don't feel like getting in the word that morning, right? You ever been there? Paul says, it doesn't matter, it's a command, do it. Man, I'm coming down, I'm fixing some cereal this morning, I'll open up my 10 booklet, and there's those 10 people I'm supposed to pray for every day. I've been doing this over and over and over again. How many times can I pray the same thing about the same people for this entire month? It gets a little boring sometimes. Oh, come on. Paul says it doesn't matter how you feel, do it. I'm sitting beside my coworker at work, I sit there for eight straight hours with him. I know he needs the gospel. I know I need to bring up Jesus to him. But I just, it just doesn't feel right. What if it turns awkward? What if, he, what if he doesn't want to come to church with me? What if he just completely doesn't? Understand something, church, before I say this. God has sovereignly placed you where you work God has sovereignly placed you, student, in the school that you are in, not for the purpose of just getting an education, adult, not for the purpose of getting a paycheck, but for the purpose of sharing his love and his grace. It's not an accident that you sit beside the same people every single day that do not know the Lord. He sovereignly placed you there. And just because you don't feel like doing it, Paul says, no, understand, it's a command, do it. Do it, I know it's hard. Do it. See, I think Paul's urging us all to understand that every single day we've been commanded to practice and to develop spiritual habits in our lives. 
Bible readings, prayer, scripture memorization, sharing the gospel, serving others. Every single day, train yourself for godliness. But here's the dirty secret. Training yourself for godliness, it takes work, hard work. Look at verse 10. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. So to what end are we toiling and striving? What is all of our work for? The work of training yourself in godliness. But what is our, what is our motivation? Why do we do it? Because we have our hope set on a living God. It is because that I have been redeemed. It is because that I have been made new. It's because Christ has died for me and made me alive in him that fuels me to chase after him every single day of my life. Don't miss that. Pursuing godliness, Christian, takes what D.A. Carson says is grace-driven effort. It's because of what Christ has done that I'm able to put effort in. Listen to what he says. Long quote. It says, people do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience, obedience to scripture, faith and delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience and call it freedom. We drift towards superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking that we have escaped legalism. We slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves that we have been liberated. A strong. I think what Carson is saying here, nobody just drifts their way into godliness. You don't just wake up one morning and boom, you're godly, right? It doesn't just happen by accident. Becoming a godly Christian requires movement. It requires work. The pursuit of godliness requires great intentionality and work. Why? Because an idle Christian is a drifting Christian. So if godliness is the direction of the Christian life and I have responsibility in this journey of becoming godly, then I must develop spiritual habit into my life. I must begin to train myself for growth. I must take regular action to have more and more of God in my mind and in my heart. I hope you're beginning to see that that spiritual growth is a great result. It's a great side effect of developing spiritual habit. See, church, the, the heart of 10 is that each and every one of you, whether you're killing it spiritually or whether it's dry, whether you're a new believer or whether you've been following him for many years, the, the heart of 10 is for you to know and enjoy Jesus every single day of your life. The heart of 10 is that every person who calls Riverside Church their home would be intentional about returning to Christ, to glorifying him in the way that we live, all because of what he's already done for us. So as we close our, our time together this morning, I wanna give you just a couple minutes to think about and to evaluate your pursuit of Christ, your pursuit of godliness. A couple questions I think we have to ask and ask honestly and answer honestly is, is are you intentionally pursuing godliness in your life, Christian? Do you have an intentional plan to use spiritual habit in your life? Like what spiritual habits do you need to begin today? Another way to, to gauge goals is to put parameters around them. Ask questions like, uh, what time of the day am I going to practice this spiritual habit? Who is going to practice this habit with me so that I'm not doing it by myself, but that others can be encouraged. We can encourage and pursue and, and push one another into godliness. So I'll say it again. One of the beautiful things about 10 is it lays out for you a map of how to implement, develop, and use these spiritual disciplines in your life. If you want to be if you want your walk with Christ to be deepened, if you want to leverage your influence in this culture, then you must begin to use spiritual habits. Habits of 10 minutes with the Lord each day. 
habits of praying for 10 people, 10 verses committed to memory, 10 gospel conversations, 10 missional expressions, 10% of your income given back to the Lord. If you are a believer, you have an incredible promise from God that one day you will be made Christ-like. So since godliness is the direction of the Christian life, then by grace-driven effort, we pursue godliness through the use of spiritual habits. Don't dismiss this as, as childish or, or juvenile. I mean, Paul's writing to a pastor that his purpose is to relay this information to his church, right? Man, I hope you've been using spiritual habits for many years. But if not, you must start today because godliness is the direction of your life. That is the future you, but you have to get there. I think if you've claimed to follow Christ for some time now and there's not been any growth towards him, you better be asking a question. Why is that? If that is the direction of the Christian life, then it seems like I will be progressively getting more and more closer and closer to Christ likeness. But if I've been following him for 75 years and I'm the same exact person as when I came to Christ, something's wrong. Church, let us be known as a people who walk with Jesus. Every single day of our life, every single hour, let's be about Jesus. As I pray and end, um, you just move how, how you wanna move. Be a couple pastors up here. If you need to come and pray, then come pray. If you wanna sit in your seat and pray, then pray. Just do business with the Lord however you want, however the Spirit's moving, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, your word is so simple to understand sometimes. God, this is not hard to understand at all that the direction of my life is to pursue you. God, that I'm motivated to pursue you because of what you've already done for me. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would push us. God, that they would... Holy Spirit would drag us into godliness sometimes, God, that we would be faithful even when we don't feel like pursuing you, that we'd get up and obey your commandments to pursue you anyways. Father, give us a heart for you. For it's in your name I pray, amen.